right on the shelf because it's so utterly unique uh, perspective. He's concerned about economics, history, uh, American involvement in warfare, military things, and brings it all together in a very unique perspective, and especially dealing with that period of the late 19th century after Reconstruction, which was the, uh, the time that uh, I'll take my stand people grew up in. You know, that was their heritage, that troubled period after of the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, and I look forward to Joe's discussion on those matters which concerned the agrarians of 90 years ago and I, which I think we're learning very much here is still very pertinent for today. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Uh, I want to settle two things at, just at the outset that came up. Um, one is that I was down in Boca Raton, Florida at Florida Atlantic University when the famous article came out in Modern Age. And I went, went by my major professor's office, this was William Marina, some of you knew him. And he said, look, there's a great new article in Modern Age by this guy, Clyde Wilson. And I read that thing. And it really was a reorientation. After that, I also read a lot of Murray Rothbard, and I possibly overdid that. And that's why, like another speaker, I can say that I've been spending 15 years recovering from the excesses of atomism and economics. That said, I'll try to be as summary as I can. I had a notion about introducing this with a text by Lin Biao, who was some kind of Chinese communist vice president. And in 1965, he wrote this pamphlet. It used to be everywhere, called Long Live the Victory of People's War. One of those pamphlets. Taking a party line and try to explain how a bunch of Marxists should be allowed, under their own theory, to lead peasant revolutions in Russia and in China. Well, it wasn't a very good ex explanation. They're claiming to get two phases of history for the price of one. And Trotsky did that, Lenin did that, and he did. But in this pamphlet in 1965, before he fell out with the party, apparently, he set up a world struggle. And he said, well, it's really, and he left out the part where they didn't tell the peasants that when they got the land, it was gonna get taken away again. But anyway, he said, uh, it's a global struggle of the countryside versus the imperialist metropolis. And he's got the quote here. The countryside, and the countryside alone, can provide the broad areas in which the revolutionaries can maneuver freely. The countryside and the countryside alone can provide the revolutionary basis which we go forward to final victory, in this case, apparently for him, against the imperialists led by the United States. Now, a fellow named uh, Robert Johnson did an article noting a parallel and saying, well, this is quite a lot like American populism in the late 19th century. Uh, the, 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 there's something in common. Okay, we know Lin Biao probably isn't very sincere, but nonetheless, he's set up an argument that reminds me of a famous book by Raymond Williams, The Country and the City. And he's another guy, he's supposed to be a Marxist. But Raymond Williams could farm. He did farm. And he became a very interesting literary critic in these areas. So just uh, prefacing it with that. Another parallel case I found after I noticed the piece by uh, this Robert Johnson was a piece by Cheryl Payer. 1979, an international organization, some journal like that. And she's saying, well, the World Bank and the farmers, what's the World Bank want to do with the farmers? The World Bank wants to get rid of the farmers in places like Africa. You know, get them out of there, make them quit farming, make them go to the city and work for wages, and then the capitalist corporate farmers can come in and feed the world. That's the World Bank plan and it still is. Okay, 
Now we go back to an essay, I'm continuing my parallel, in 1937 by Andrew Lytle, called The Backwoods Progression. It's in a collection edited by Emmy Bradford in recent memory. And Lytle's argument is that the whole frontier process was an attempt by the plain folk in the old world and the new world to escape from the benefits of the Whig style of economic management that Alexander Hamilton was going to embody. That the, the frontier process was basically an attempt to not enjoy the benefits of the modernizing English state. Okay, that said, I'll launch into uh, my, my, my paper. I'm trying to talk about agrarianism, republicanism, and laissez-faire, if laissez-faire even means anything. And I'm gonna argue that provisionally it does mean something, but nobody agrees on what it is, and I'm gonna use it in the sense of saying that there's a division between two kinds of laissez-faire which are only approximate to some ideal or some model you might have. And the borderline, I think, in, in the end is 1860 between the two styles. And the first laissez-faire wasn't perfect, but it was better than the second one. And the second laissez-faire is unfortunately the point where so many libertarian theorists started. They went back in the, during the New Deal and were shocked by the New Deal, and they reread all the apologists for Gilded Age capitalists and took that, as to be, took that to be the free market, okay, or something like that. Okay, so, in the beginning it was laissez-faire. Nobody agrees on what it means. Richard Hofstadter, a famous historian, complained that Jefferson and his party failed to fashion a positive program of agrarian economics and pr to provide a government that would help the agrarians at the expense of the capitalists and thus Jeffersonian theory became the political economy of the most conservative people in the country, like William Graham Sumner. Now this isn't exactly right, nor is it exactly wrong. Uh, worse luck, if you make, as Hofstadter seems to be doing, the kind of laissez-faire favored by Mr. Lincoln's coalition, Gilded Age capitalists and federal judges into the logical heir of Jefferson's position, you collapse two broadly incompatible economies into one, which you then dismiss, being a modern liberal, okay? Um, and the older studies weren't much help. The old books by Harold U. Faulkner and Sidney Fine on laissez-faire uh, were muddled and had confused categories. Vernon Lewis Parrington was fun, but again, he had some good insights, but left too many things unanswered. So what do we say in the, over the long haul? Uh, when well, we say that later interpretations, New Deal liberal, uh, well, progressive New Deal liberal and New Left haven't resolved all the issues either. Now, I found a guy who, who is actually helpful here, James E. Block. He's trained in, I guess, religious history, and he has a book called A Nation of Agents, published in 2002. And he realizes we're looking at two broadly different models that are said to be the same thing. And his summary goes like this. From about 1860, new economists came along, mostly from New England, and justified the second laissez-faire. So these are Latham, Perry, Newcomb, there's a bunch of them, expanded the logic of a system of corporations rather than people. Their central task, he says, was to discredit, this is the quotation mark, discredit antebellum anti Jeffersonian society rooted in prosperity and independence and self-reliance. While championing a new economy of institutional priorities, rewards, and coercions. But Lockean theory or any Republican theory could only handle so much closure, okay? So these economists had to rationalize the loss of the independence based on widespread property ownership and uh, exhort people to join the bigger division of labor and work for wages and get consumer goods. And that was the meaning of life. Okay, um, and a further point he makes is that these economists declared the self-sufficient, small-scale and decentralized framework of antebellum life to be outmoded. Okay, um, and the result, 
the result is that Americans became agents of the system. That's why, where the agency comes into, and he ties this into uh, s certain Protestant themes. Um, so Americans were su subject to rational calculation and free in the same way that atoms are free in, under the laws of physics, okay? So like Madison's constitutional setup, the new economy would go of itself. Now he adds, Block adds, that the new modeled economy, quote, was neither natural nor inevitable, for they had witnessed and recorded its rise and foreclosure of other possibilities. And we're back to the legal system, which the last speaker talked about, the, the impact of that. Okay. Anyway, if Americans accepted this servitude, the regularity of society would then be attributed to the natural order of the economy and any theological props would be dropped from the argument. Okay, so, in other words, this is my, this is me now, not, not uh, Block. The second laissez-faire became textbook theory, capitalist apologetic, and legal ideology precisely when the most, most of the real preconditions of economic freedom had long been demolished by legislation, judicial ruling, and occasionally warfare. So it's a, a bit of a, a come down. I was talking to, to Dr. Devaney yesterday and I said that it seemed to me that the, the Philadelphia School economist, County Regay, and these people that he and Scott Trask and uh, Kerry Roberts studied so thoroughly about 20 years ago were not this kind of laissez faireist And he, t he agrees in principle, but he thinks that they weren't as specific as Taylor in stating the preconditions of what we might call, well, some kind of free market. Uh, uh, okay, now we have to uh, deal with some terminology. And here I'm not going to treat capitalism as some hypothetical entity studied by economic ideologues, but it's only an economy with private ownership of the means of production by somebody, production for profit, rational accounting, market prices, and free, propertyless, wage laborers. A lot of societies could fit that definition of capitalism, including Latin American colonies under Spain. They did have those things. There may be a little feudal hangover rhetorically in, in the Spanish colonies, but it's essentially a capitalist order of some kind. Now in England, feudalism gave way to feudal absolutism, and thence via enclosures and other policies to agrarian capitalism, and finally to overseas empire and industrial capitalism. Any lazy affair associated with 19th century liberalism, to jump ahead, had a distinctly Hobbesian, Benthamite, and centralizing character. Basically, a political elite would say, we're going to enforce a thing called a free market. We're going to change all the customary rules, overthrow everything people are doing, uh, take, kick them off the land, whatever we need to do, and then we're going to call that a free market. And then, thenceforward, we can claim that we are practicing laissez-faire, because we will have no further changes made to this new system. And you have to read Carl, Carl Polanyi. He's a bit muddled, but he's right. The new system was imposed, which kind of undercuts the notion that it was a free market. Okay. Now, the same considerations apply to the second American laissez-faire more than to the first. British laissez-faire typically, typically amounted to minor adjustments, a little bit of freedom, a little more regulation here, a little more freedom there, in an economy that was already a Hamiltonian economy, because that's the economy that inspired Hamilton. So if the Brits liberalized their economy in the 19th century, it's sort of pragmatic, it's still kind of Benthamite in spirit, and it may be laissez-faire compared to things they had done uh, a decade or two earlier under the, in the, end, at the last gasp of mercantilism, but I'm, it's not, not anything to be impressed with. Um, whereas um, the first American laissez-faire amounted to a rejection of this British political, political economy within the limits that we could get away with that. Now we come to the, one of the missing categories. And this is small commodity production, or small scale production, or the household mode of production. But this is the economy in which people have their own resources, and they can work in their own place, the craftsmen and the farmers, and 
The terms tend to come from Marxists because they've thought about it, but then they think it can't be restored and they don't want it. But the terms come from them. But so any search, in my view, for a hypothetical purely free market, if we want to think about the thing as a heuristic device or something, would require getting behind English agrarian capitalism and even feudal absolutism and arriving back in feudalism itself and looking at the sector within feudalism of this small commodity production. I mean, the English peasants weren't demanding the right to take their surplus goods to local markets because they wanted to be kicked off the land and work for wages. They just wanted to sell a surplus. That's a rather modest objective that they had when they wanted to be allowed into markets. And markets were actually physical places at the time. They weren't an economic abstraction. Okay, so, so here among the peasants and artisans, we find possibly the nearest thing to a properly free market if we want to think about that, that, that particular term because it's unencumbered with modern banking, fractional reserves, compound interest, monetized debt. There's no mob of stock jobbers. There's no pretended sales like futures about which Dabney wrote a, a nice piece. Um, there's no will theory of contract and things now said to be essential to a free market economy. See, one of the ironies is that when the Soviet Union fell, there seemed to be no competition. So suddenly everybody loved the free market. Oh, the Soviets fell, that proves that we have a free market, and that proves it's good. And everybody became a free market Democrat or a democratic free marketeer. Tony Blair went blathering on about inter enterprise Britain while betraying the traditions of the Labour Party, even the good ones. And so this kind of thing, it's, this whole verbal uh, fiasco ensued. Now, what we had in the colonies because they were distant and there was so much land, was a chance to reestablish or establish small commodity production without the feudal landlord and without much of a state. It didn't succeed, but we had a chance in British North America. So in our colonial period, this important sector of small commodity production was reborn on this side of the ocean and was doing quite well. You could. For instance, mentioned the first hundred years of New England with the little farming villages where they made sure everybody had some land if he wasn't a complete layabout, had, had access to some land, and the clergy hadn't tried to gobble up all the land and become land speculators quite so much yet, and the merchants hadn't taken over completely. Everybody had a place in society and in the ideal New, New England village. There were a lot of studies on this in the 1970s. And you can say something about Western Pennsylvania. And the hordes of Scotch-Irish come flying in, my, some of my ancestors, and they take up farming. And it seems almost utopian. Um, and and uh, similar things happening in the South. Uh, it's complicated by the existence of planters, but things are always complicated. I mean, New, New England's complicated by having a grasping uh, class of clergymen and merchants who are inseparable from political activity. Okay. So widespread access to productive resources opened up the possibility of avoiding wage labor. I've never understood why people stand for being spoken of as being part of a labor force. This started probably with the New Deal. My father hated being called part of a labor force. It sounded vaguely socialist or collectivist to him. But anyway, um, he, was a, he was a skilled, skilled craftsman. Um, as long as this favorable ratio of land to people could prevail or last, a uh, few people would want to work for an employer unnecessarily. There might be some reason to, but not because you were going to starve if you uh, didn't work for an employer. That's the whole point is dependency. So part of the whole process in the last several centuries is a war on private provision. By private, I do not mean atomized individuals, but I mean families. And, uh, you know, you have your own land, you have your own resources in some way. Okay, so let me go on um, and say that this, these local economies that have been studied in North America, based on small holding, could support local craftsmen who also had a bit of property. Capitalism as we know it could not gain a foothold. Um, now, wherever this existed, of course, it had enemies and they did not shy away from using political power to eliminate this kind of economy. R. H. Taney, interesting English economic historian, among other things, um, 
said this. He said, uh, much, he said um, that much of the transformation he was talking about can be studied best of all in the United States where a population of peasant proprietors and small masters was replaced in three generations by a propertyless proletariat and a capitalist plutocracy. All right, let me see. And so the, you can say that a lot of American history has been the process by which uh, this interesting society has been prevented from continuing or has been restricted and whittled down to nothing. And people as different as John Taylor, Charles Beard, Ransom, Lytle, Walter Prescott Webb, uh, Richard Franklin Benzel, and Michael Merrill have told parts of the story. Okay, now I'll just say, um, I have a category called English Employer Ideology, which is kind of clunky, but English employers tended to have a bad attitude toward labor in England. Uh, and it wasn't, and, and whether in the new world they were going to indulge in slavery or, or having wage laborers didn't really matter so much. They had a bad attitude toward labor, they expected laborers to work, you know, 18 hours a day and be grateful. And it's that sort of thing, and tip your hat or whatever that is, um, forelock. And that's part of the picture, which I won't go into because it's not time. Now, the Normans had imposed the most centralized form of feudalism in Europe. Later, with the rise of feudal absolutism on the continent, the illusion was created that England had always been freer. Well, at this point, it was a bit freer. Um, but despite that, feudal absolutism arrived in England and led to some political upheaval. Uh, in the 16th century, witnessed a wave of enclosures in response to a growing wool market when, where the saying was that sheep ate men and London wool merchants uh, were doing well. So this is the beginning of agrarian, of agrarian capitalism. And fa uh, fast forwarding past some revolutions and Puritans and things, we'll talk about the Whigs after 1688. They become a court party. It's the coalition of large Whig landowners, allied bankers, and merchants who run England as what E.P. Thompson called a banana republic. Things were for sale. Not everybody could buy them. There were social distinctions. You couldn't buy everything that was for sale, but everything could be for sale. And he says this was a predatory phase of agrarian commercial capitalism involving killings in the manipulation of credit and in the seizure of offices of state. And in this system, the king was just a chief lobbyist. He wasn't really much of a monarch, George III, for example. Um, so the institutional pillars of the Whig oligarchy were the Bank of England from 1694, the Promissory Notes Act of 1704, making private notes for IOUs, making them into money. I mean, if I've borrowed five shillings in the pub and I write a guy a note, he can pass that note to a third party. Well, the courts didn't use to enforce the, the, that claim. They say it was just between the two the original people and it's a point of honor. We're not going to enforce this thing and maybe they saw that it would inflate the actual money supply. I don't know. Anyway, so with uh, in this Whig oligarchy you have collusion between the bankers and the state authorities, placemen, people put in parliament just so they'll vote for whatever the king wants, uh, pensioners who owe the crown, and Dutch investors who came over with William of Orange. Okay, so it's quite an interesting uh, period. Uh, Namier did a lot, uh, endless number of books on this historian named Namier, which are, it's terribly boring subject matter, but they are readable. Okay, um, well in opposition to all this, because it did, they had to tax somebody to make this system work, you have the country party. The country party initially were small Tory gentry led by Viscount Henry St. John Bolingbroke and his associates and a couple of famous poets and writers spent all their time denouncing Sir Robert Walpole, his financial system, monetized national debt, increased taxation. And they kept up a constant uh, barrage of uh, rhetoric against fictitious wealth or paper wealth, stock jobbing, fund holders, and insurance schemes hard to distinguish from gambling. There's a famous novel by Charles Devenant and Tom Double in 1702, where a modern Whig is telling an old Whig 
what the new system is all about. And he says, well, it is true that we have run the nation over head and ears in debt by our new devices. And then he says, or before this, I, I changed the order. For what had become of our party if it had not been for these projects? Can anybody think of a quote from about late 1860 of a similar tenor? What about my revenues? Very similar. Okay, um, at the heart of the country party ideology, or con country party or English opposition ideology was the armed independent proprietor. Not independent, he's not alone, he's got a family, he's got dependents, but he's armed, he's on the land, and he's an Aristotelian citizen. Okay. And by the time of George III, this whole argument is taken over by radical Whigs, and the Tory party is, or whatever it's become, the changing sides is in power. And so they carry on this critique with the Republican language, but they broaden it to include any kind of independent enterpriser. So they bring in some of the lower middle classes and uh, uh, people of that kind, and it's broadening. Now in the New World, with all this land, you could broaden the definition of the ideal Republican citizen infinitely, which is what we kind of did during the revolution. Now to fast forward through the revolution, well first I'll say that there were large land grants in the colonies, James II was famous for huge land grants. Somebody, some guy named McCullough got granted something like half of North Carolina. Anyway, some huge acreage. Um, and there's some local trickery with land grants. And as Albert J. Knox said, land speculation was the first American industry. Nonetheless, there was so much land that didn't do much harm. People could still have land and uh, create this sort of peasant utopia, or a peasant artisan utopia, which hadn't been working out in Europe, and people who are suffering from enclosures in England could come here and experience peasant life uh, without those inconveniences. Okay, so, uh, here, I'll say one more thing about that. In, in, in America, right, as the revolution is pending, they have a small economy of farmers and craftsmen did not unduly suffer from the so-called scarcity of money. This bothered people who were in business and long distance trade. They were worried about scarcity of money. In the local economy, you didn't need money. I mean, it's nice, it's a convenience, but you could exchange labor with people. I go work on your house, you come do something, and we'll have a nominal price because we, we know what money is, but the price will be fictitious. We'll just keep trading favors until we're, when we're about even. Now this sort of thing still continues today. I mean, I've done it uh, with people. I mean, I had a guy who was a car mechanic and I'd do carpentry for him. You know, you can stay outside the money economy. This is not the worst thing to do. In any case, you don't need formal modern banking to have this kind of exchange and a credit system that isn't enriching a bunch of guys in suits. It's just actual credit between real people. Doesn't always work. You can, you can feel cheated in this informal economy, but nonetheless. So as Michael Merrill points out, such practices continued well through the 19th century until, of course, the new, the new system uh, made this less and less feasible, except as a kind of micro pocket in the real economy. Okay, so the revolution, uh, eh, maybe skip ahead. Well, we have the revolution and its coalition and the conservative elements in the revolution, just imagine the revolution will make us independent and then they will take over the jobs in the British mercantilist apparatus. And other Americans in the coalition didn't want the mercantilist apparatus especially to continue. Or at least they didn't want their existing freehold economy to be tampered with. Now when the, uh, the ambitious types decide that the confederation has failed and they want a mercantilist government that will look like a federation but be more like a unitary state and then they get they're able to do this they put their constitution through and they put themselves in power suddenly people say well look everything they said in the constitutional ratifying conventions was a swindle they feel cheated and rightly so and then you get the reaction that will eventually bring Jefferson to power and, and push back against this attempt to establish a kind of American mercantilism to favor 
the people Hamilton wanted to favor. Okay. In any case, I'll just make a, a passing point that I think that the small-scale economy was not a, a doomed transitional phase between feudalism and capitalism, as the orthodox Marxists would say, but in fact was an interesting positive model of a society that might have been worth preserving. Okay, so we've gotten past the Articles of Confederation. Um, what am I doing for time? Okay. Now, at the Constitutional Convention, one of the main themes was to fret about the instability of Republican government. They're all fretting. And as Henry Bamford Parks, who was an Englishman who became an American historian, put it in 1947, the people they feared in terms of Republican instability were not the oppressed proletariat or serfs of Europe. They were the broad American yeomanry. And Charles Pinckney got up in the convention and tried to tell them they were legislating for the wrong country. They didn't need to go on about that. But he wasn't, I guess, listened to very well. Okay, so the Federalists um, did what, what I've summarized and created a reaction. On the other hand, the Republicans themselves, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, didn't dismantle this whole mercantilist apparatus. And this caused, beginning from about the late 1810s, a reaction within their own party. And the Tertium Quids, Randolph, Taylor, Macon, and some other people restated the pure country doctrine against their own party. And in this way are predecessors to some of the radical Jacksonians. And there's a great book by Norman Rizjord, that's a good place to start. There's a lot of writing on this. Okay, the, um, the vast supply of open land was the ace in the hole for the Jeffersonians and the Jacksonians. They weren't shy about wanting to have contiguous land further west to help the system keep going. Now, there was some lack of planning there because there's an interesting process by which all that land, this big agri publicus, eventually wound up in the hands of timber companies, land speculators, railroads. But that's, a later, that's part of the later story. At least it was possible to, to actually get land. And there were debates about the price of land and so on, but nonetheless. Um, um, now, the question is, could this Jeffersonian, Jacksonian laissez-faire, if we want to call it that, the first laissez-faire, who found his own internal Republican corrective, a device for keeping the rich and well-connected from buying the laws, buying the judicial system, and institutions that shape the whole economy. And that's our problem. I don't know. Well, apparently, it, in that instance, did not work. They didn't have an, the internal, quite the internal corrective, although I suppose secession was uh, part of an attempt. Uh, Okay, um, anyway, the, real, the first laissez-faire, to characterize it broadly, and knowing that laissez-faire is not a perfect uh, term in either sense, rested on tangible property, actual partnerships, and real title transfers, and not on fictitious capital, fractional reserves, trade and paper promises, capitalization of expected income, or the corporate form. It was a rejection of these traits, and that's what made this laissez-faire at least in relative terms, something like agrarian republicanism. And the informal credit system, if you look at Robert Wiebe's book, The Opening of American Society, he says the informal credit arrangements continued for inland trade based on trust uh, down to about 1850. And there people risking money, and they did invent credit rating, though, in the informal credit system. But the point is they're doing it without taking a bank loan and paying interest to somebody, much less compound interest. Even that continued. Uh, so even as late as 1850, think all was not, not lost. Um, but, of course, after the Hamiltonians were out of power, they plotted to get back in. They would work at the state level to introduce their measures, and you have the canal building uh, era and certain disruption along those lines. And Henry Clay democratizes the Hamiltonian program, gives it a new rhetoric, makes it sound nice. And his best student was an Illinois lawyer born to the Southern Plain folk. Okay. Industrialization is already rising by the 1830s and uh, Boston and Concord, uh, Connecticut Valley and Lowell. And by 1837, 
as John T. Flynn put it, they had forged the weapons of aggressive promoter of the aggressive promoter and monopolist, and J.P. Morgan perfected those later. The mightiest weapon of all was the corporate form. This John T. Flynn writing in 1941 on a book called uh, People of Wealth or something. Um, in any case, um, another factor that has come in already, we have talked about legal issues in the previous talk. Uh, um, lawyers basically displaced the old gentry. Politician lawyers were what replaced the gentry. And being lawyers, they were habituated to not thinking in terms of um, lasting moral values. <laughs> it's an adversary legal system, so they were very good at changing state constitutions, dominating legislatures, so even the Republican, that is Jeffersonian legislatures, were full of these lawyers who would, uh, at the local level, try to build a kind of state mercantilism. Um, now, Charles Sellers in the market revolution, uh, Dr. Devaney was pointing out last night that it needed a better title than that because it's not actually the market that causes the revolution. But in any case, um, Charles Sellers describes the legal developments from at least 1817 during the communications and transportation revolutions. So the canal projects again uh, favors the corporate form so a large bits of capital can be aggregated and big projects undertaken, monopoly privileges, subsidies, and so forth. So the lawyers are the shock troops of this capitalism. Although I don't use the word capitalism in any other sense than a historical one. So I, 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 I don't see the point. I'm, if I want to talk about something that's not capitalism, I'm going to say what, what, what I'm talking about. In any case, um, the lawyers altered the legal system to assist entrepreneurial interests, and you can find this in Morton Horowitz's first book on history of American law. Uh, Wythe Holt, who taught at the University of Alabama for decades, who was a kind of Jeffersonian Marxist, and became a Marxist in the 1980s for some, for some reason, but still a Jeffersonian one, uh, is good on the history of the, the legal changes. Um, Anyway, uh, so the lawyers are working at what they're working on. And the arrival of Joseph Story on the Supreme Court it was a very bad sign about how infected the Republican Party had become with Federalist economics. Okay, there's a lot of issues I could go into there in detail that where these two laissez-faire's or the Hamiltonian and Jeffersonian model differed, but we kind of know what they are and people have talked about them already. So I'll uh, fast forward. Uh, do I have much time left? Oh yeah, you've got 10 minutes. Okay, um, so skipping ahead. Well, one of the problems we had in general, it's a broader cultural problem, was that Americans liked gadgets. Americans liked machinery. And they couldn't imagine if you kept putting machines in the garden that you might not have the garden anymore. Referring to the book by Leo Marx, 1964. Well, that's kind of how it started to work out. Um, I mean, Thoreau dabbled in making this critique, but Thoreau is never very committed uh, anything, and he's almost as bad as Emerson for being vague and airy. Um, but in any case, um, machines in the garden. And this is related to a problem that, that Parks p points out, which was that Americans, in the end, didn't want to live by their own professed values. A lot of them wouldn't do it. Every American thought that he should get rich, or she should get rich, and we could all do that and act to get rich, and somehow that wouldn't undermine the whole way of life we had. We should all try to get rich, okay. And this was somehow feasible. So you're putting the machines in the garden and all of that, um, skipping over some things. I have a few more things on the South. Uh, there's a few paradoxes with the South. You've got big planters, but you've also got the sectors of small-scale commodity production. So that not enough time for that. Now I'll, I'll fast forward to the war, and I'll I'll quote one thing from Eric Foner, not our favorite guy, but Eric Foner said about 19 uh, I think 79 that the northern farmers and southern yeomen had so much in common that they suffered the same defeat. The war inflicted the same defeat 
on the northern yeoman than it did on the southern yeoman in its own way. It's a parallel case. And Lewis P. Simpson has made the same parallel, saying that the New England nation, its victory over the southern nation, was also the moment of the defeat of New England, meaning the classic New England village and all that small-scale stuff that some of them had and believed in. I find it's impossible to hate everything about New England. <laughs> Ninety percent maybe, but not everything. Okay. So there's a long echo of this um, old agrarian republicanism, which I first wrongly call the first laissez-faire, and it can, it's continued down as late as someone like Estes Kefauver, uh and people that believe in antitrust regulation and, and what have you. Um, and of course, there's a transmission belt from Robert Toombs and Alexander Stevens down to um, uh, Tom, Tom Watson, and there's an interesting set of connections. So Parks, in the end, says that Americans failed to appreciate what we had and didn't know how to keep it. Now, Roland Bertoff, who can sometimes be quite useful, says that American notions of community and a rough equality between citizens became transmuted into a vague ideology of egalitarianism. And so you could then go around saying, well, as long as there's equal competition, nothing wrong. And Lincoln was a great snake oil, snake oil salesman for this uh, ideological innovation. He says, well, as long as we've all got the right to compete to be a railroad mogul, there's nothing wrong with the economy. And we can all lose our land, doesn't matter. He didn't actually say all that, but you can kind of read that in. And he may have been sincere, I don't know. It's actually it's hard to believe that, but anyway. Um, okay. Now, Agar says that Lincoln thought that this union meant the failure of democracy. And then he says that the experiment might fail as a result of turning the country over to northern business did not occur to him. Agar, this is from Agar's book in 1935, the year before the Agrarian Manifesto. Agar had already published. Agar's disappointing because he got so wrapped up in intervention as it looked like we'd be in a Second World War, that he devoted all his attention to foreign policy after that and became a war liberal and then a Cold War liberal and wrote books praising presidential power. So Edgar kind of lapsed as an agrarian. Now I want to say, if I've got a minute at all. Five minutes. Okay, there's uh, some latter-day agrarians that are worth mentioning. There's like an underground uh, tradition, if I can find the right page. Uh, you have a number of writers in, in this tradition. Oh, here they are. Uh, and the 30s stimulated this kind of writing. So you've got the two books we're talking about here. And you've got Agar's book of 1935, Walter Prescott Webb. He's a Texan. Divided We Stand, The Crisis of a Frontierless Democracy. I think printed in 1938 and in several different editions. Uh, he, was, he was quite uh, vivid and has a nice discussion of corporate personality. Uh, Willis Ballinger, By Vote of the People. He was mostly writing about republicanism, but republicanism and agrarianism overlap. So Willis Ballinger in 1946, Henry Bamford Parks, the book I've mentioned in 47, A. Whitney Griswold, Farming and Democracy, 1948, from a guy who became president of Yale. How can you put that together? Grant McConnell, The Decline of American Democracy, 1959, he's a Californian, and his, his ax to grind in the book was that the, uh, somehow the Farm Federation, the Farm Bureau of Federation, whatever that is, had become a, a weird public-private uh, outfit that controlled farming. And in Leo Marx's book, Machine in the Garden, 1964, and of course, going back into the 30s and coming toward 1955, all those agrarian manifestos by Lewis Bromfield, a northern agrarian, interesting character. Across the water, the historian, Catholic historian Christopher Dawson noted how English agriculture was being sacrificed to the interests of the city of London, meaning the bankers. So England was killing English agriculture, which is, they still do. It's a tradition in England now to kill off English agriculture. What is to be done? I don't know. There's an interesting book now by a Dutch economic historian named Bas van Babel called Invisible Hands, question mark, in which he says that we've had four cycles at least, 
of an economy opening up, becoming productive, benefiting most people, and within a couple hundred years, the newly rich elites find out how to control the legal system and they induce stagnation for the rest of us while trying to remain rich. So we're in the Anglo-American version of that process. Um, I guess that's a good place to leave it. We've let the freehold pass. Thank you.